Well, good morning. And uh, would you turn in your Bibles to the fourth chapter of the book of Mark as we find ourselves in one of my favorite parables that Jesus said. Now, the reason I like this passage of Scripture so much is because it speaks to our ability to see, our, our vision. Uh, specifically, our peripheral vision. Now, peripheral vision is the ability to focus, to see an object when our attention is focused in a different direction. Uh, I mean, peripheral vision is the capacity to see what's going on around us while we focus our line of sight a different direction. In fact, all great athletes have peripheral vision. I mean, take, for instance, running backs um, Marcus Allen and Emmett Smith. They were great running backs, but did you know they didn't have great breakaway speed? You know what made them great? They had superior peripheral vision. They could see what other running backs couldn't. Now, spiritually speaking, peripheral vision is the ability to see what's going on around you in life. You could say it is uh, the larger background behind the immediate foreground in life. And in this parable, Jesus wants to expand our peripheral vision. So let's dig in and see what he says. Notice Jesus begins by saying the kingdom of God is as if. Now we have to pause there. We can't go any further in understanding this parable until we understand how Mark uses that phrase, the kingdom of God. You see, kingdom is a word we love to use, but we seldom define. The problem is, kingdom is a difficult thing to analyze. In the Old Testament, God promised Israel a kingdom, and they waited hundreds of years uh, for God to fulfill that promise. Uh, the Old Testament prophets predicted Messiah would come and sit on a throne in His kingdom. And then when Jesus came to this earth, He began His ministry by announcing the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, He was saying, it's here. I am your king. I am Messiah. Israel now have its king and kingdom. But if you remember, in Mark chapter 3, the religious leaders rejected Jesus as Messiah. They attributed His miracles to Satan. And so, as a result, Jesus uh, no longer publicly pronounces the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, it is now postponed, not canceled, but postponed, and Jesus begins speaking of a different kind of kingdom, a present kingdom, and he begins communicating to his followers cryptically in parables. You see, this is a critical time in Jesus' ministry. He no longer anticipates a throne in the kingdom, but instead he now anticipates a cross at Golgotha. So the question is, what exactly is the kingdom of God in this present age? Well, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 17, that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's, it's not something that's tangible. Uh, I mean, it's not something that's physical, it's intangible. And then he clarifies further in uh, 1 Corinthians 4 when he says, The kingdom of God is not words, but in power. In other words, it's not verbal, something we can hear with our ears, but it is powerful. And then if that's not mysterious enough, the author of Hebrews tells us the kingdom of God is unshakable, but it's not visible. Now think about that. The kingdom of God is something we can't see, we can't touch, we can't hear, but we are asked to embrace that which is intangible, inaudible, and invisible. So what in the world is the kingdom of God? 
Well, the, the kingdom of God is synonymous with God's rule. In other words, people who choose to live in His kingdom, though very much alive here on planet Earth, are choosing to live under God's authority, His rule while they live here. Now, every one of us in this room that's an American citizen probably had an ancestor that came to the United States as an immigrant. And then at some point in time, uh, your ancestor chose to become an American citizen, which meant he chose to live under uh, the authority of the United States government. Now, an American citizen that submits to and lives under the laws and authority of the U.S. government would be considered a good citizen, wouldn't you say? That you could call that citizen living, couldn't you? Now, that's what Jesus is talking about here when he talks about kingdom living. It's living in submission to God's authority and his rule in our lives. Now, that's simply said, but not so easily done, isn't it? I mean, it's because... I mean, at any given point in time, we're not confident about what God's doing in our lives. I mean, I'm much more comfortable with retrospective interpretation of what God has done in the past than I am with relaxed insight as to what He is doing right now in the present. I mean, the reality, most of the time, we don't know why God does what He does. Now... Rest easy, Jesus realizes that. And so he wants to communicate two simple but profound truths about kingdom living that's going to expand our peripheral vision. He wants to do that in two parables this morning. The first one begins in verse 26. Let's dig in. It says, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and arise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now, this parable is only found in the book of Mark, and it's one of the most encouraging parables Jesus communicates to his followers because it talks about expanding our vision, our spiritual eyesight. In other words, Jesus in this parable is going to remind us that kingdom living means trusting what you can't see rather than focusing on what you can now, I have a Bachelor's of Landscape Architectural degree, and uh, in my coursework I took uh, many courses on horticulture, and biology, and none of that helped me when it came to planting a lawn in the mountains of Colorado. Now, we, we lived at 8,500 feet above sea level, so I had to do my homework, figure out what kind of grass grows there. I had to prepare the soil correctly. I did all my research I broadcast the seed. I watered it. Nothing happened. I decided I'd water it twice a day. So I went out there two times a day and watered it. Nothing happened. I decided to put down some root stimulator fertilizer. Nothing happened. I decided to rebroadcast the seed. This time I, I put mulch on top of it. Nothing happened. And I was getting frustrated and discouraged when I remembered what a county agent had said years earlier. He he said, don't worry about it. Be patient. The seed knows when the moisture and temperature of the soil is right. It will come up. You know what? That county agent was right. One day I walked outside my house to get in my car to leave, and I looked over there, and there were millions of little bitty green sprigs all over the area that I had seeded. And by the end of the summer, I had a full-blown lawn. Now, what Jesus is saying in this parable is the kingdom of God is just like that. In fact, I think the key to the whole passage is found in the last half of verse 
27 and the first half of verse 28. I mean, notice what it says there. It says, the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crop, the crops by itself. Now, that phrase by itself is the Greek word automatos. It's where we get our English word automatic. Can you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying the seed will yield the crop automatically. I mean, what Jesus is saying is that in God's economy, there are powerful forces that are at work whether we are aware of them or not, they, they are forces that will operate whether man stews or frets about it or not. In other words, Jesus' point is God is working. In fact, God is always working. God just didn't create this world, set it in motion, and leave it alone. He's not sitting in some heavenly palace looking down passively, not engaged in what's going on. God is actually orchestrating history here on this planet. I mean, He's actively involved in what's going on here. He's present and in the middle of all activities that are going on. In other words, right now, God is working in your life, whether you're aware of it or not. And sadly, uh, though, uh, as Christ followers, we long to experience God in our lives. We tend to live life oblivious to the fact that God is actually working. God is always working. In fact, I remember when uh, I resigned my position from the church I had planted 15 years earlier in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, I was sitting at McDonald's uh, this particular morning, uh, thinking about what I was going to say at my resignation, public resina- resignation that night. And I was getting a little frustrated and annoyed, and I was having a conversation with God. You see, I had resigned my position in a church, but I didn't have a place to go. I was facing unemployment. And so I was sitting kind of in the back of McDonald's having a conversation with God that kind of went something like this. God, I I know you made it clear that I was supposed to resign. I've done that, but what do I do now? I mean, what do I do next? I don't have a place to go. I mean, God, do I put my house on the market and maybe sell it out from under my family? Or do I wait till I have a place to go and then I put my house on the market and hope I can sell it in time to take the new job? And I was kind of going back and forth with that and I was getting more and more worried, fretting and fretting when my cell phone rings. It's Patty. She said, Doug, you're not going to believe this. The strangest thing just happened. This woman just came up and knocked on our door at 7 a.m. She said, I put my robe on. I answered the door. She apologized for knocking on the door so early. And then she said, you know, I've admired your house for years. If you ever want to sell it, call me. I want to buy it. And then Patty said she gave me her name and number on a card and handed it to me. Isn't that weird? And I'm thinking, no, 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 that's that's not weird. That's God. He has been working all along. I was totally unaware of it. Totally unaware. In fact, I remember sitting down, talking to a man about his marriage. He, He admitted he wasn't the man he wanted to be. But he wanted to change. And as we began to talk and meet over the next two years periodically... I began to understand why his wife was so frustrated with him in their marriage. He was a piece of work. And then we were working on it. (laughs) And we were talking about how to improve the marriage and how he needs to engage. And then one day he showed up and dropped down divorce papers and said, My wife just served me with divorce papers. And he felt like the end had come. She was fed up, got tired of all his empty promises. She wanted out of that marriage. 
He looked at me across the table. He said, I know God hates divorce, but Doug, he's not doing anything to change your heart. He said, I can't wait until this divorce goes through. And he got up and left, mad at God and more determined than ever not to fight for his wife. Well, two days later, I'm sitting in my office and I'm chatting with his wife and I'm just shocked. I am shocked as she tells me how God had been using the words of a friend to penetrate her heart and to expose her selfishness, her pride, and her unwillingness to engage with her husband. And then in this broken state, she looked at me. She said, Doug, I would give anything if I had not filed for divorce. It's the biggest mistake I'd ever made. And as we talked further, it became very apparent to me. God had been working in her life all along. The problem was her husband couldn't see. And as a result, he gave up on the marriage and was angry at God. You see, there'll be times in your life that it doesn't feel like God is working. But Jesus is telling us here in this parable, we've got to develop a peripheral vision. We've got to become aware that there are powerful forces always at work. The problem is that when God is working, His work is usually hidden. We can't see it. I mean, think about it logically. God is most pleased when we walk with Him by faith, right? So most of the time, His work's not going to be evident. Otherwise, we would never be able to walk with Him by faith. I mean, I want you to notice the parable. There there are two responsibilities of the farmer in the parable. Did you see them? The first is he is to broadcast the seed. The, The second, he is to harvest. So he's to broadcast the seed and then he's to harvest. What's he to do in between? Trust. He is to trust. He is to trust in what? What he can't see. So how do we trust a God for what we can't see? Well, I think there are four core beliefs. Every Christ follower with peripheral vision must adhere to. Let me give them to you. The first is that God is good. In fact, everything about God is good. All that He does is good. He always will act in your best interest. Now, it may not seem like it at first, but even painful, hard times can work out for your good if you continue to trust Him. So the first is God is good. The second is God is in control. In fact, there's nothing that happens in your life or my life that doesn't filter through His kind, loving, compassionate hands first. So God is good. God is in control. Thirdly, He is all-powerful. God is all-powerful. In other words, He could change the events in your life immediately if He wanted to. He's not restricted in any way by the use of His power in our lives. And then finally, God knows better than I do. You see, you and I are bound by time and space, and we can't see clearly. If we were to see from God's perspective, we would thoroughly understand why the things were happening that were happening. In fact, I love the way Philip Yancey defines faith. He says, faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. That's walking by faith. You see, God is most pleased when we exercise faith and walk with Him by faith. That that means most of His work is going to be hidden. If it weren't hidden, we wouldn't be able to walk by faith now, would we? But, But you need to know there is a third perspective in this parable. It's found in verse 28. Look there with me. It says, for the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, uh, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now, did you notice there's a process? There's the blade, then the head, then the full mature grain. 
In other words, there's an inevitable process that takes place. So that process is going to require patience on behalf of the farmer, isn't it? Now look at the word immediately in the text. It says, when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle. It means without hesitation. So when God's work becomes evident to us, our responsibility is to join him, to immediately join him, to leap forward and join him in what he's doing. Now, that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about engaging men from their heart. I mean, most all men wrestle with the question, do I have what it takes? And most men take that question to their wives, looking for validation. Or they take it into the corporate world, looking for validation there. But what they receive does not take them through life. It won't last. It's incomplete. I call it a half-life manhood. But when a man discovers what God has placed in his heart, that God wants to call out of him, I've watched men come alive. In fact, the, the most frequently repeated refrain I hear through what we're doing with men in the material we've been teaching is, I wish I'd heard this 10 years ago. I wish I'd heard it 20 years ago. It would have changed the way I relate to my wife, to my kids, how I relate at work. You see, when a man discovers what God has placed in his heart that needs to come out, he becomes alive. And that's where I see God working. And I want to join with him in what he's doing there. You see, what Jesus is saying here in the text is when we see God's work evident, then don't hesitate. Don't postpone it. Join him immediately. And when you do, it's going to be fun. And you're going to get to see him work in ways you couldn't have imagined otherwise. So Jesus is telling us in this first parable that uh, kingdom living means trusting what you can't see rather than focusing on what you can't. But remember, there are two parables here. The, The second one begins in verse 30. Notice what he says there. Then he says, what shall we like in the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It's like a mustard seed, which, when it's sown in the ground, on the ground, it's smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it's sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. I mean, do you see it? Jesus is again telling us how do we develop our peripheral vision. He says the kingdom is exactly what happens with a mustard seed. I mean, in the Jewish mind, the mustard seed was the smallest of all the seeds. Uh, In fact, there was a phrase, a proverbial phrase, as small as a grain of mustard that was used during Jesus' day. And so Jesus takes that phrase from the culture and wants to use it to encourage his disciples. Now, there are those who who will say that Jesus was mistaken here. He was misinformed because, you know, the mustard seed is not the smallest of all the seeds. There are hundreds of seeds that are smaller than a mustard seed. So Jesus misled his followers and was not well informed. How do you answer a critic like that? Well, I think you've got to realize that Jesus was simply accommodating a proverbial phrase of his day, and not only that, the mustard seed was the smallest of all seeds they were aware of in Israel at the time. So Jesus was being truthful. Now, a mustard seed was about uh, the size of a grain of sand. I brought one along so you could see it. (laughs) Now, you're going to have to look at the screen to get a picture of the size of it. And what's so ironic about that small seed is it grows into the largest plant in the garden. A mustard seed like that, when it's fully mature, becomes tree-like and it grows into a tree that can be 8, 10, even 12 feet high. The largest plant in the garden. And Jesus says, saying, well, the kingdom of God, in other words, God's rule is just like that. It begins small, it's hardly noticeable. Now, what that implies is there's nothing insignificant done in the kingdom. 
There's nothing too small, even the smallest acts of service. In God's economy, he's saying, can actually have profound results. In other words, kingdom living means remembering that insignificant beginnings can have significant results. I mean, think with me for a moment, the obscure beginnings of the kingdom. It began with a man born 2,000 years ago from an obscure village. He was a carpenter. His ministry didn't last but three years, during which time he never wrote a book, never wrote a paper. I mean, never held political office. He never traveled more than 200 miles from uh, his hometown. And if you could take all the people he spoke to and put them in a stadium, they wouldn't even fill one stadium that maybe Billy Graham would speak to. From those obscure beginnings, though, his ministry has influenced the entire world. You know, when John Cloud declared his major in college, he had no idea how that small decision would impact his future. When he graduated from college in engineering, he went and joined an engineering firm in the Midwest. And his firm was awarded uh, contracts for building canals uh, throughout all of India. John was to head the project in India. Now, now th- this project happened to come at a time when there was great famine going on in India. And so John and his company were able to put tens of thousands of Indians to work. Now, John was a Christ follower, and uh, he looked for ways to lovingly engage with his employees. He modeled uh, the love of God, and he had a natural way of communicating and talking about God's forgiveness and God's grace. And and as a result, over the next two years, over 10,000 Indians came to know Christ. Through his efforts in his two years of tenure there in India. Small beginnings can have phenomenal results. I mean, the, even the smallest decision, the smallest act of service, like, like volunteering to pack meals for feed our starving children, or, or maybe joining Horizon in what we're doing with orphans in Mexico, partnering with Back to Back, or, or maybe just providing a smile, greeting people coming into this building on the weekend, can seem so small and insignificant to you. But if you're living as a kingdom citizen, it can have phenomenal impact. Now, that's what I think Jesus has in mind when he says the mustard seed grows so large that the birds of the air find shelter in its branches. In other words, God's kingdom in your heart becomes a life-giving source for others. In fact, Rosera Butterfield understood the life-giving source of the kingdom. In her book... The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, she tells about her years as a leftist, atheist, English professor at Syracuse University. During her tenure there, she wrote numerous articles for the local paper, usually railing against uh, right thinking and their doctrine of of hatred, their politics of hatred. So you can imagine she got an avalanche of mail. She said she'd put the mail she received in one of two boxes. One box labeled fan mail, the other labeled hate mail. And then one day a letter came. They couldn't go in either box. It was written by a local pastor. And in a kind and inquiring way, he encouraged her to look again at the conclusion she'd come to. Ask her in the letter how she came to those conclusions and what standards she used for moral right and moral wrong. Uh, Rosera said uh, she threw the letter away, but she couldn't get the thoughts out of her mind. So she ended up fishing it out of the trash can She read it again, laid it on her lap, and just sat there. Now, that letter eventually led to a dinner invitation. And 
the beginning of, in the process of a two-year friendship with Ken and Floyd. That, that was the pastor and his wife. Uh, Rosera said, they entered my world. They got to know my friends. Uh, they, they engaged in uh, book exchanges with us. We talked about sexuality and, and morality and politics together. Uh, they befriended my friends. They didn't act as though what I held polluted them in any way. And then one day, uh, the pastor suggested that she buy a Bible, and she did. She began reading it. And then Rosera found herself one Sunday morning in a pew sitting in Ken's church feeling rather conspicuous with her butch haircut, but she was there nevertheless. And in her book, she said this. Then one ordinary day, I came to Jesus, open-handed and naked. In this world of, uh, this war of worldviews, Ken was there, Floyd was there, the church was there, Jesus triumphed. I was a broken mess. My conversion was a train wreck. I did not want to lose everything that I had loved, but the voice of God sang a sanguine love song in the rubble of my world. And it was God who used Floyd and Ken to sing that song of acceptance so that she could hear. You see, Jesus' description of birds in the parable is really a picture of God's rule and reign in people's hearts that become so pervasive that people start coming from every direction to seek shelter under the rule of God's kingdom branches. And here's the good news. You and I get to be a part of all that. Father, thank You for this encouraging parable. May it cause our hearts to come alive, thinking that You are always at work. I I ask You to give us eyes to see and ears to hear where You are working. And then, would You please give us the courage to join You in what You're doing. And we look so forward to seeing You work Your kingdom business in that process. In Christ's name, Amen.